There's a guy named Sprawl, R.J. Sprawl, and um, great theologian, wrote a lot of books, but one of the books that came to mind today while preparing this message was his book that tells us about this Jesus and who he understands Jesus to be. He tells us that from a manger, poverty, inflicted life, to all the way through his ministry, all the way through shepherds, all the way up to glory. And he wants us to understand this morning that this is not just another biblical story. And I want you, when you walk out of here today, I want you to say, huh, I never really thought of it like that. So I'm going to stretch you just a minute and try to help you see it in a new way. You know, one of the things that I find most interesting about this particular story is uh, all of the symbolism, all of the light and darkness and white and all these things that are going on in, in the story. And I think we can get lost in the story. And I don't want you to get lost. I want you to be very present. And in your presence this morning, I want you to understand that the glory of Christ shines forth. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come now to have this word illumined that we might see it anew and that we might find ourselves charged and excited as we move from today into the Lenten season. I ask that the words of my mouth and all the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the book I referred to is uh, titled The Glory of Christ. If you haven't read it, eh, it's, it's not a hard read, but it, it'll challenge you in places. But I think you'll find it to be most interesting. We have to understand that this whole trans stop Trans means what? A change, a cross, that kind of thing. And figuration actually can be, we could use another word for this figuration, which is a metamorphosis. This idea of a worm that becomes a butterfly, this fantastic metamorphosis of life, and that this metamorphosis we're going to talk about today takes a very human Jesus and for the very first time gives us a glimpse of his divinity. One of the huge arguments in the life of the church has been how can one be fully human and fully divine? How can that be how can you be two at once? enough that it separated the church, enough that it caused theologians to lose their mind. New denominations formed, new churches came up, and boy, oh boy, we're in it now. So today, when we think about this transfiguration, this human Jesus giving way to a divine Jesus, what must this have meant for the disciples that he took up the hill. You know, a lot has been said uh, about this idea of uh, a comparison between Moses taking three up the mountain, Jesus taking three up the mountain, this idea of God glowing and causing Jesus uh, to become this bright, glowing light, and Moses also a glowing light, but not within himself. It is simply a reflex, reflection of the radiance of God on Moses. Two very different things. So I wouldn't make a lot out of that story, you know, trying to compare the two, but I just wanted you to be aware that it's there and that you'll hear some people want to really lay on that story and make it be the premise for this story. And I want to tell you this morning, it's not in any way. You know, 
this is a point. I'm going to have three points this morning, so here's number one, point. When Jesus, when this occurs, when Jesus is glowing, when his garments are white, when he is just beaming all over, what does Jesus say? Let's go. He doesn't take a second to bask in the Son of God moment that God has just bestowed upon him by saying, listen to him. He's my son, the one I love. He's beloved. He's the one. Jesus says, let's go. Church, I'm telling you this morning, let's go. There's no time to sit around and bask in the radiance of your light. It's time for you to take that light into the world and let it shine and let it somehow transfigure, transform, ignite a spark in someone else's life. Don't be selfish. Now, the selfish mark, I would stand around. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, look at me. I'm glowing. <laughs> but that's the difference between Jesus and Mark, one of the many, <laughs> but that's the difference, <laughs> is that the reality here is, is that in my humanness, I love to bask in something when it happens, and Jesus is about getting to it. Let's go. How many of you ever been truly tongue-tied, absolutely didn't know what to say, whether it be in any moment in your life, you just didn't have the words, you just didn't, and then you uttered something stupid. That's never happened to me, but I've seen others it happened to. <laughs> but the idea is, is that when you read this story, why are we going to build some shacks for Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. Because I don't know what to do. I'm overcome with this whole thing. I don't know what to say. So I'm going to say something really dumb right now. Let's build something. That's the humanness of the 12. I don't know what to do. I can't just be present in the moment. I got to do, I got to build, I got to do something right now. Can you be present in the moment of your life? Can you take a beat, say nothing, but understand that God is at work in you? It's also pretty interesting, I think, in this story that while we're coming down the mountain and Jesus says, don't tell anybody till the day of resurrection, the three of them look at each other and say, what? What's he talking about? I have no idea. What is he talking about? A day of resurrection? See, you and I, we have the benefit of reading this after the fact. We know what he's talking about. We know that Jesus is going to die. He's going to get raised from the dead and all glory. And to oh a boy, it's going to be a wonderful Easter celebration. They don't know. These three men have no idea. So I'm going to tell you, point two this morning is there is good news and hope for you and for me. When I don't know, I say these guys didn't know either. So it must be okay to take things on faith, to just be okay, to somehow understand that God's working in some way that we may not understand, but it's okay. I think that one of the real joys of this scripture, it reminds you and I of clouds. What happens when a cloud comes? Thank you, James. It's going to rain. Biblically, what happens when a cloud comes? 
God's going to speak. Something big is going to happen. Something's going to go on here. Genesis, there's a cloud over the whole thing, and the cloud parts, and, G- and God does what? He forms the continents, and he goes through all this magical, wonderful creation out of a cloud. A cloud comes to Mary and says to Mary, I'm about to change your life, sister. She doesn't quite get it. But God's working. God's speaking. God's doing God's thing. So here, we see another cloud come. And this time this cloud comes, and it is God revealing who he understands, who he knows Jesus Christ to be. This is my son, with whom I'm very well pleased. I love him so much. And what you have to do is listen to him. Do you ever get so busy you can't listen? Christy, thanks for your prayer. Because it reminded me this morning that sometimes I don't hear God because I got too much loud noise in my own ears. I cannot hear it. I can't hear him. I can't see. I can't be a part of it. I'm praying so hard. I want something so bad The answer has come, and old Mark missed it. I just missed it. Don't be so busy. Be about the light that is in you. Be about this change. Be about this metamorphosis of who you are through the gift of Jesus Christ in your life and go do something with it. Please? Well, this is a good time for a commercial break. So the commercial is, we're going to have this class that many of you have been asking about coming. It's going to begin on April the 4th. It's going to be eight weeks long. We're going to study seven world religions. The book is easy to read. You'll find it most interesting, and I hope that it gives you some insight, especially to the world as we know it today, with everything that's going on in the Middle East, everything that's happening. Hopefully, it'll give us maybe some grounding and some opportunity. So for those of you that are interested, that's it. It's coming. I've been telling you it's coming, and I want to introduce who is going to be my co-facilitator for this group. It's Christy Burnell. Stand up, Christy, please. Christy has graciously said, yeah, please, give her a hand. Yeah. (laughs) Christy, a member of our church, has been just so willing to be a part and to do, and when I asked her if she'd be interested, she said, heck yeah. I said, okay, sister. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. So, mark it on your calendars if you want to learn something about world religions, and uh, we'll, um, we'll get to it starting April the 4th, and um, it should be a fun time. I'm looking forward to it anyway. While trying to make sense of the whiteness of Jesus' garments... Does anybody even get that? I mean, I don't, I don't get it. And I've been to seminary. Claire, you get it? Yeah. I mean, what about it? But it reminded me of Melville's book, Moby Dick. Read it? Remember it? No. But yes, you had to read it, I'm sure. One of the chapters in there is called, I'm going to get it right, the whiteness of the whale. If you don't do much of anything this week, I encourage you to grab your copy of Moby Dick and just go to that chapter. I don't have time this morning to go into it with you, but it is fascinating because this whiteness of a whale has great theological meaning, especially in light of the text that we're reading for today. Isn't it interesting? How many of you ever been had something so great happen to you in your life you couldn't explain it? It was just wonderful. Raise your hand. Just wonderful. Just outstanding. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, I'm terribly sorry. There's still time for you. 
How many of you have been so down, so sad, so depressed, so dark that you could not see a light if it was shining in your eyes? See, in the Christian life, we go for those moments of great joy and heights and this whole exhilarating wonderfulness that's called the Christian life. I heard somebody say many years ago, I heard somebody kind of equate the Christian life to a commercial airline pilot. Commercial airline pilots spend all day flying aircraft, and what they try to do is they try to do what? Find you smooth air. So they climb and they ascend and they get to where they feel like it's smooth ride for their passengers, and all of a sudden they turn off the seatbelt light, things are good, they got autopilot on, they're getting coffee, and the next thing you know is the seatbelt light comes on, and they're changing altitudes because the air wasn't as smooth as they'd hoped for. This idea of the Christian life and smooth air should give us a little understanding of how we are constantly changing our altitude. Trying to find smooth air in our life. Only to be challenged by turbulence, bumps, and the assorted rough ride we call life. This morning, through this illumination of Jesus we are seeing this divine being, not the human Jesus, but this divine Christ that is promising you and I a life of not smooth air, but promising us, as Christy said in her prayer this morning, promising to be with us even when there are bumps and we've got to change altitudes or courses in our life. What in the world does a transfigured face look like? Greg, what does it look like? Ooh, oh, that's kind of cute. Wow. Oh, okay. Freckles, nice. What does your face look like? Claire has said it since the first day I met her when we were holding worship over in the fellowship hall in a contemporary Christian atmosphere. And she said, you might be the only Bible anyone ever reads. You. So what does your face say? I want to tell you all this morning that I believe we are all transfigured through Jesus Christ in our lives. And all we have to do is let ourselves shine. Let ourselves be about the work of the church in this place and in this time. Fellows that went north yesterday, how much more face of Christ do you need to be? Fellas, cooking hamburgers yesterday, serving at the parade. How much more face of Christ does one need to see? Driving down the road, what face do you have on? As we move toward the cross, through the upcoming Lenten season, I believe we need to ask God to transfigure us so our faces might even shine brighter to all those that we meet and to give us the strength so we can follow God's command. Listen to my son. Please say it with me. Listen 
to my son as you and I journey to the cross one more time. Amen.